a special presentation after that. Uh, uh, the topic is, uh, you can see there on the browser, it's the LSD trap. And so that, uh, as you, it's, it's designed to be mind tingling. And so uh, we look with anticipation with that uh, presentation. But prior to that, before that study, we're going to have a special interview with the country living, uh, with Brother Emmanuel uh, Coulange and Sister Doris uh, Richardson. Uh, but before we do that, let's just have a word of prayer, and then our interviewer and guest will move forward with the program. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for your goodness and mercy. We want to thank you, Lord, for your love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we talk this evening, Lord, may it be edifying, Lord. May it lift, lift our heart towards heaven and, to, and towards what you're doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Bless us to this end, Lord, and may our thoughts be holy and our actions be holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here this Sabbath afternoon and doing the Country Living segment. And also I think that this is special because this morning, um, if you all didn't listen to the I want to say it was a lecture education kind of um, sermon this morning, and we talked about health, right? We talked about, um, to sum it up, how we, how we as Christians, we put our faith into the health institutions that is designed supposedly or we think to help us, but we have learned that sometimes, most often, it was just the opposite. It didn't help us. But we also know that God has given us a plan, a health message. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not follow that. At least a lot of us don't. And I just would like to um, discuss, in relationship to country living, connecting that as to some of the reasons why we don't listen to the counsels that have been given to the church and why we depend on the worldly system as far as healing and when we get sick. Uh, good, oh. good afternoon or good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm happy to be, uh, to share with you my uh, experience, uh, although not uh, <laughs> extensive or expensive, but uh, God has been good to me and uh, especially that uh, I, if you know my story, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born in the church. I know the message probably I can remember since I was six or five. And uh, I, I, I knew what the message was. This is not something that is new to me. Or oh, when I grew up, I, I took a position. When I was young, I knew what the message mean. And uh, so, uh, and I think is as the children of uh, uh, Israel, as a uh, sojourn in Egypt, they pick up all, all the habits of the land. And that's what is going on to us, uh, or at least to my generation or to myself. And uh, we found it difficult sometimes to admit that this is not what God has told us to do. And uh, too often we we value more what they will offer. And especially in terms of uh, health care, uh, I used to go to uh, back home in Haiti. Uh, I used to value a lot uh, our hospital, uh, the care uh, from, the medical, from uh, the medical field. And I never heard about medical, uh, medical missionary work. And I went to New York, uh, living Haiti. And uh, while I was in New York, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, I was, uh, I'm the healthcare myself, I'm a respiratory therapist, and I had 18 years under my belt. So I, I knew about the healthcare. I had other people around me who were doctors and so on. And uh, we heard about uh, Loma Linda, all these uh, uh, great facilities, and we tend to value that what the world had uh, to offer to us this is what God, this is what we were supposed to do. And uh, Ellen White says, there is a lot of things that we have to unlearn. And 
for me moving to, count, to the country now, I realized, oh, there is a lot of things that I have learned that I need to throw away. I need to discard them because they are not in line with what the Bible is or what God is asking us to do. I would say that if you're in the health field, like I'm a nurse, I'm a registered nurse, and you're a respiratory therapist, you're right. Sometimes it's harder for us to let go now since we've been in the field so long and to now start trusting in God's remedies. It's just like if you have a headache. <laughs> My mom, I grew up with, you take three Tylenol, and that would knock that headache out in no time. And you don't think about the natural things that God has said. Think about maybe you're dehydrated, right? Just something so simple, drinking water. You know, when the last time, even if you had, a, um, you, you release yourself or if you're constipated, you don't think about that. It's just so easy for you to take Tylenol. So you are more dependent on that Tylenol because that works too temporarily, right? Yes. So we don't think about that. Um, we, we uh, usually what we look at, we look at a quick, a quick fix, okay. And especially if you have, if you are in the medical care, uh, and this is this is where where uh, uh, the delineation, the difference come in. We can still go to the hospital, but it must be for for a quick fix. It must be for an emergency. Even uh, when Sister White is talking about drugs, which is not uh, the topic this evening, she's saying, okay. If you take in it, take it, and try your best to get to get uh, to get off, uh, 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 not to stay too long on it. I think that's to me that's when when I'm reading that's what I'm that's my understanding. So she's saying try at best to stay away from drugs because drug doesn't heal us. God is healing us, and uh, the drug may force our body to react and the healing process take place. But uh, for, for somebody who spent uh, 18 years in the medical field, and uh, I will tell, my wife will say, okay, Emmanuel, uh, my son had uh, several asthma, uh, asthmatic episodes, and uh, being a therapist, I'll, uh, I say, okay, uh, you don't have to do tea, you don't have to do this. Uh, she will use, uh, what is uh, that oil? Uh, castor oil. Castor oil. And uh, that's what they used to do back home. But given that I'm a therapist now, and I said, uh, uh, my wife, I, I'll tell baby, that's my wife, uh, the way I call her, I said, I don't know how much, what is uh, the dosage you are using for, for our son. Since I'm in the medical field and I know I can use saline, I can use uh, albuterol, and uh, I saw their effectiveness. And I said, uh, let's just uh, use what, I'm using in the field. I'm I'm a professional. Let's rely on what I'm what I'm doing. Yeah. But uh, often uh, she will she will listen to me. But she was puzzled by telling me that's not the way we were raised. Not because she understood the message, but uh, just to tell you that uh, I believe in science, and that's what the world is promoting: science, science, science. But science has its limitation in the fact that science. Science is from God, and what we are doing, or we are limited. Since we are limited, what we produce as science is also limited. So is, I, used, I, I like using this example uh, with my brother one at Seven Adventists. If you have, if you have, uh, you have a, a Ford, you want the Ford manual to solve any problem that you have with a Ford car. So you're not going to use a, uh, a Chevy or a, a Nissan to, use to solve a problem that you have with a Ford car. So we are doing science. We're counting on God. But God is the one who makes the manual. So if God tells us, okay. this is what we need to do, whoever else is telling us, this is the way it is done, okay, they are coming from their perspective but they are not coming from the perspective of God. And that's why we have a special message that comes from God that tells us, this is how I want you to take care of the body, because the body is the temple of the Lord. And I want to say that this is the connection that I see with country living, because I hear a lot of people say that they are afraid to go to the country because of if, and I'm just talking for that group that says, if they come into health issues, 
not that they already have issues because, and I'm not blanking this across the line saying that everyone shouldn't consider their location in the country because of health reasons because some people do have to consider that that they need to be close to a hospital for different conditions. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that for good, healthy people, they are, I'm talking to those that are hesitant because they expect if they have an emergency with health that they won't know what to do. And I'm saying and to encourage you that we need to start practicing good health practices by the counsel that has been given us and we won't have that fear. That fear will be so less. And one of the reasons why we don't believe in it and our faith as we were talking about it is because we don't do those simple things. We're not using those things to believe it. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I always say if, if you know that someone have had, let me see, what, what's an issue that, that comes up? High blood pressure. Let me say that because I have struggled with high blood pressure for years. And I've been on medication on and off, on and off. I hate taking medication, and then I would come off. But I have learned, personally, I can say if someone has high blood pressure, they can talk to me because I know some of the things that really work, like making sure that you are hydrated. You have to get your water in. You have to start drinking it at least 32 ounces in the morning, and you can put lemon in that water, and you can drink it slowly. Don't guzzle it down because that's not as effective. And throughout the day, making sure that you drink your water. If you have um, an elevation or spike with your blood pressure, you want to do, um, you can do hydrotherapy. Meaning that you can put your, just very simple, put your water, put your, your feet into a bucket of water, warm water, and then as, as warm as you can tolerate it, then you can um, take it out and you can put cold water on, on, your, on your feet and then go back and do that transition a couple of times. And I guarantee you that works for me. I can say that confidently. That will bring your blood pressure down. Stressors, if you're stressing out about something, you want to take that to the Lord. You want to start praying. You want to say, Lord... Um, I'm anxious. I'm thinking about this situation. Please help me. Please help me just to relax and put it in your hands and you start praying. And I guarantee you, your blood pressure will go down. You can start drinking um, different herbs throughout the day. Um, chamomile, anything, lavender, that will help. Um, um, different things that you know. What did you say? Oh, yes, that helps too. And juicing. Sometimes if, my, if I feel that my blood pressure is, is high, I'll just go ahead and I'll juice like celery and I'll juice greens, any greens in the refrigerator that I have. I even, um, carrots work for me too. I don't know why. Carrots and then I put an apple in there. And it's probably because it's just giving me that nutrients that um, I'm missing. But those are the, the simple things that you can just start doing when you know that something is wrong and that way you have confidence to share it with someone. So if someone has high blood pressure and um, they're moving to the country or whatever, they can do these things that is helpful. Uh, I'll share two experiences with you today uh, about uh, uh, one is mine experience, mine, and the other one is uh, an experience I have with another border. I think I shared it once here. Uh, uh, I'll share the one with my border first. Uh, I've been involved with uh, uh, several clients, helping them uh, under the guidance of uh, Sister uh, Burton. And uh, in one, one of the cases, one of the cases, uh, I had a brother in, uh, in Virginia. And then he called me, not he called me, I called him because mm -hmm. I was looking for a job. And I said, maybe this brother can, can help me. And then uh, in the conversation, he told me, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I just had an accident. I said, what happened? He said, I just broke my leg. Mm. And then I said, yes. He said, yes, I just broke my leg. And he said, uh, uh, they, I just came from the doctor, and they told, they told me they're going to amputate my, uh, my leg. He said, this is the third time I've, I've, uh, break, uh, I've they broken. They wanted to amputate it? Yes, I've broken uh, uh, this leg. So I knew him from back home. And then... I said, oh, my brother. I said, uh, what do you want to do? He says, uh, uh, I don't want them to, cook, uh, to take my leg. So I'm willing to do whatever I can do now to, 
to, to, to, to heal the leg. But he told me, the doctor says, they just sent him home, uh, consult with his family, and the next thing he come back to see them, they will amputate the leg. Wait, I just want to pause right there, because let's just take that in. If, I mean, what is the response? Just think about that. If you have just been in an accident, a car accident, and you correct me if I'm getting the story mm -hmm. wrong, and the doctors who we trust, who we are relying on, they tell you that we want to amputate your leg, we want to take this leg off, because evidently we're thinking that if we don't remove this part of your body, this leg, then you might not make it. <laughs> And you go home and you tell your family that, what do you think your family is going to say? They will say, do it. <laughs> do no, it as we, fast as you can. Just a leg. You can, you can make it without a leg, but I want you to be, I, I want you to be alive. You, you, so you have that on your side like, man. So what, uh, when the brother told me that, I said, okay. Uh, I said, uh, you still believe in the message? He said, yes. And I said, uh, there is something we can do. I said, uh, if you, we're still praying and we, you still believe in the message, uh, I have somebody who, can, who is helping me and I can uh, share uh, her knowledge with you. And uh, if that's, uh, you want to try it, I'm willing to help you. Wait, I just want to interrupt one other thing too. So for you to have that confidence, you have been working with... S with Sister, Sister Marvel Aberton. So that built up your confidence to go back to yes. say that. Yes, I, I was confident. Not only uh, she shared with me her, her experiences, and I read some of the stuff online, some where, she's, where she took uh, some of her uh, uh, counsel or advice. Uh, and I, I, I trust it. I read uh, 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 Ministry of Healing. Uh, so this is the message that we have to, we have, that's where we need to have our faith. So I could share it with uh, any doubt. And uh, I, I, when I told, the brother fe fell from the back of a truck and he had a, uh, I believe, either, uh, uh, he had a, p a part, a flower part he was trying to put in the truck. And the, 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 the flower pot fell on his leg and he broke it. That's what happened to him. He broke it at the level of his uh, knee. So the doctor said there is nothing they can do about it. He's too old, he's in his 60s, 60s and uh, they have to take it off. So <laughs> I told him, if you are willing, let's try something before you go back to the doctor. He told me, if you can help me, uh, it's, if it's natural remedy, I will do it. I said, okay, my brother, uh, let's try, let's try uh, comfrey. And that's what we did. So uh, the doctor told him, uh, there, is, there is no way the, uh, the leg can heal back. It's, it's almost impossible. So we, we started doing the comfrey, and I told him, you will need at least three months on comfrey to see uh, uh, some result. I, st I stuck with Sister Marvela, and we said, okay, we're going to go with that one. So I you, three months, you set aside that you were going to work with it, three months. Yes, I said, we stay in touch, and... I explained to him what he has to do. He's in Virginia, I'm here in Alabama. And I told him, I want your wife to be involved. You're going to do uh, poultice, and you're going to do uh, fermentation. That's what we did. And I asked him, started asking well, can him. Can you very ex um, explain poultice and um, fermentation? Poultice is uh, it's just a paste. You make with different, uh, I don't want to say uh, flour, but it's like, it's flowery. Okay? It's a, okay, powder, yes, thank you. <laughs> it's a powder. So uh, they come from uh, leaves or woods. So you, you bought them, and there is so many of them, and you just add water. Most of the time, it, they are warm, but they, some of them can be also cold. And you just make the paste and apply it to the area. And Inexpensive, right? No. Water and powder. Okay, powder from lee, from, from leaves. From, right. Okay, nothing else. So that's what the brother did. And uh, I, I will send him also some comfrey uh, pill that I get from Sister Mavala. And I told him, okay, you take the pill three times a day or five times a day. And then uh, you, you, you keep me informed. So I spent three weeks. I didn't hear from him. I said, oh, 
the brother is not calling me to tell me anything. What is going on? And I said, okay, let me call him. I call him, he's not answering. So over a month now, he called me back. And I said, my brother, what are you doing to me? I said, we were supposed to work together and you never call me, you never inform me anything. And then he says, oh, Emmanuel, I'm so excited. <laughs> he says, uh, I'm working now. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> now he's challenging me now. Because I was, according to what I was told, he cannot... Uh, Talking to him. He, he should see results not after one month. You understand? And then uh, he told me, Emmanuel, I'm working. But I'm working with a cane now. He said, well, I could, what I, I uh, did not expect. And he says, I have, uh, I have an appointment in uh, maybe one or two weeks with the doctor, and uh, he's ready to show off, I'm telling you. <laughs> so I said, my brother, calm down. Don't do this. He says, yes, I'm going to the doctor. <laughs> he says, I'm going to show him what God can do. So that's what, that's what, I, what happened. And then I don't think the brother is taking any more comfrey. From the, from the six week on, he told me I have pain now, but uh, I think God is healing my, my, uh, my, broken, uh, my broken leg. And he went to the doctor. The doctor says he cannot believe what had happened to him. He says uh, the bone is healing like a baby bone. That's what he told him. But the brother also shared with me, I didn't know that, although I, I know him from back, back home in Haiti, he told me from the time I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I stopped eating bread altogether. And when I asked him, why? Why so, you are so drastic? He said, yes, because when I, read, when, I, when I heard the message, I knew they were putting stuff in the bread that we should not have in our body. So he said, I'm almost now uh, 40 years without those things in my body. I said, wow, now I understand how the healing process takes place. Because he has been treating his body the way God asks us to treat our body. Because he doesn't put some, a lot of stuff I used to eat, he's not even eating them. So his body is, to me, is uh, ready for any attack. And then when you put uh, the uh, right nutrient in, it just, it just do what God is uh, intended, uh, God intended uh, for our body to do. So that was my experience with the border. Amen. There's a lot of lessons in that. And the last one that he was saying that your, um, your friend, his immune, immunity or his immune system was strong because of the choices that he made even before then. So when this accident happened, that probably put him in the best shape that he could be in. And with that being said in closing, I would just like to encourage those out there that are even if you're living in a city or going to the country, is to take hold of the health message. Amen. Uh, if I can add something, uh, I've been struggling with uh, my cholesterol, my overall cholesterol, HDL and LDL. Okay, from, from the time I, I was probably, from, 20, from 2003, I ended up having a surgery because I was pushing my body so hard with exercising, uh, changing my diet to see if I can get rid of, uh, reverse uh, the trend my cholesterol was taking. So my cholesterol was, uh, used to be close to 300. So, but I've been down here. While I was in New York in 2019, my cholesterol was still high. HDL, uh, two, Your uh, cholesterol? My, all my cholesterol, okay? My overall cholesterol, my HDL, and my LDL. They were all out of, out of place. So I've been down here for two years, and I, didn't, I was not thinking about cholesterol. I was just thinking about, okay, what do I need to change because I need to follow God's plan. And changing my diet, uh, eating properly, uh, better now, and uh, I went to check because I had, uh, that's another uh, testimony, I had uh, something going on with my heart, and... Uh, I went to, to do a blood test, and when the blood test came back, all my cholesterol was in shape. I was, I was not expecting that, but I'm just saying, I, I, they were supposed to put, put me on medication in New York for, to correct my cholesterol. And I, for probably almost 18 years, I was struggling mentally, okay, not knowing how, what to do to correct my cholesterol. But now just looking at my diet, changing my uh, overall uh, 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 way of uh, living, my cholesterol is in his place right now, and I just praise God for that.
just following the health message. Amen, amen. I was going back to um, the um, Bible study that we had and talking about Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, and, and they were saying in Daniel 1, 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This hit me hard because it, 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 it encouraged me that this is speaking to us in this day, that we should purpose in our heart that we are not going to defile ourselves. It's not only with just food and, and the wine. It's anything that separates us from God, anything that is of the world that doesn't draw us closer. But I'm just going to focus right now just to encourage us that we start taking steps that we won't defile our body, our temple that we would do the little things and start off drinking um, the necessary water. And I'm talking to myself, yes. um, getting out and exercising, right? We, you never get too old or too young or too fat or too skinny or too hurt to exercise. Without exercise, it's going to be an issue, right? Uh, uh, what I will add is the fact that if we understand what God is asking us to do, he's not asking us to do a lot. All he's asking us to do is to obey him. Mm -hmm. That's all he wants to from us, nothing else. When we obey him, we don't obey him because, uh, because we, we see the outcome, because we are looking for an outcome. We want to, that's why it is a matter of love. It's either love or selfishness. It's either we, we look for what can I get out of it, or we do it because we see, okay, God is asking us to do that because he loves us. We're going we, we're gonna to respond to his love by obeying him. So that's what it is about. So he asks us to exercise. We don't say, okay, uh, what should I, uh, what benefit I'm gonna get from it? He asks us to change our diet. We don't ask, I'm gonna lose so much thing that I enjoy. We just say, Lord, help me to obey you. Let, let, help me to follow you, to, to follow you. Amen, amen. And, and with that, do we have any comments or anything, just real quick? Are y'all good out there? He said we're good. Okay, so in closing, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your testimony. Um, I was able to call upon you with this one family that I had that um, it was a um, gentleman. We need more men in the field. I can tell you that right now. Us women, we are coming in contact with um, husbands of the wives and then even just men that are not married and they need a man to, um, to show them the, um, the way to have Bible studies with them. We don't have enough men in the field. So I'm encouraging um, the men out there, men of God, men who love God, to, um, to get involved. We, we sisters, we, we need you. <laughs> and go ahead. Uh, I think, uh, I believe it was Pastor Davis last time we were here, Wednesday night, was stressing out uh, the fact that uh, uh, he was happy to see so many men in the prayer meeting. Uh, this is uh, something that we have to take into consideration, men, men, men of the church. Uh, we have a crucial uh, role to play in what, what is about to happen on this earth. And uh, the women will not be able to carry the work by themselves. Uh, God is calling us to lead, and we must, we must stand up. I don't know for how long we're going to uh, be absent. Okay, we're going to uh, uh, let the men lead. But uh, it's, there's not, there is a problem there, but God is calling us, and there is a reason for that. I don't know, entire, uh, I don't know the reason in its entirety, but uh, we need to stand up, and especially in uh, med medical missionary, there is, there is, the lack is too great. There is, uh, there is too, 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 too many needs, and for the men not, not showing up. Uh, I'm encouraging you, I was not a medical missionary, okay? Uh, I didn't intend to be one, but when the call came, and I said, Lord, can I do this too? And uh, I told Sister Marvela, I'm already in the healthcare, so if you are willing to hold my hand, I will do it. So I think it's just a will, my brother, it's just a will, but we have to put our hands in the work 
There is too many suffering outside. Too many people we can, we can reach out to and give them comfort, give them hope. We need to do something. Amen. And with that, if you live out in the country, or even if you don't, even if you're in the city still, there are a lot of herbs that need to be identified that can help us. And they're growing right on your property. And so this, um, the second week in May, May 9th through the 12th, one of the, um, the things that we're going to do is we go out into the field around the area and we identify different herbs, things that we can eat. And I'm telling you, that is the best salad ever. <laughs> uh, you, you've been there, right? I've, I've been there. That's what I was going. I was so excited. Um, since since my family came, came here. Since my family came down here, every year I've been telling them. I miss it sometimes because I, I was not planning. <laughs> but I know this is one thing I don't want to miss this year. It's wild wood. I don't know if that's where you are going. Yes, that's it. It's wild uh, wood. Brothers and sisters, please go there. You have nothing, absolutely nothing to lose. Because you're gonna see you're gonna see firsthand what it is to be in the country setting. When the crisis gets here, you will see from these people how easy it is, how easy God has prepared everything for us. <laughs> and you will learn from them all. Oh, uh, you will you will not believe it. I, I share my salad with uh, my salad with uh, my family also, a salad from uh, a wild Edible, I just gathered them from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the backyard. Did okay? you do it? Yes, did I, did it. I did it. That's so the challenge, to go I did home my, and do it. My plantain, my uh, wild uh, onion, stuff like that. And it's so, it's so nice, so beautiful. So there's so much thing we have to learn, and they are not expensive, nothing. Just go there and enjoy it. And I think that's when they say your bread and water is going to be sure. I mean, she provides you with enough bread. If we just had bread and water just off of what she prepares, it is. And also gluten-free, so she gives an option. I mean, it's just awesome. So um, please mark your calendar. Save that date. It's May 9th through the 12th. I think the 12th is, is Mother's Day, but we're going to let out pretty early in the morning. But um, call me, 234-706-9233 if you need more information on exactly what what to bring and if you have any questions you can go back to the um, 11 o'clock hour and they had it posted up um, I don't think they we're gonna put it up right now but you can go back and get information but May 9th through the 12th all right and with that we're gonna close would you have prayer for us too okay. thank you thank you all for watching if you can kneel Heavenly Father we thank you for uh who you are. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, and we thank you for uh, awakening us up, Lord, uh, to what is coming. And as you are strengthening our faith, as you are changing our character, Lord, uh, put in our heart the desire and the love, Lord, to look uh, around us and to reach out to our brothers and sisters, especially in the Seventh day Adventist Church, who are still. Uh, uh, dragging behind, Lord, was still doubting your word, Lord. Uh, we were in that position not too far, not too long ago, Lord. You have uh, touched us. You have uh, transformed us, Lord. And we know that you can do the same for those who are still behind, Lord. Uh, encourage us, continue to encourage us, and continue to minister in this church, Lord, and throughout all your churches, Lord, because we know the time is here for us to step out and go to the world. Uh, bless the rest of the evening for us. Empower us to do your will, and give us more love and more compassion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
weird. As soon as I get this screen, I just use this. Is there is the remote for the uh, projector in the back? Give us just a moment. I think the input needs to be changed. So as they're getting that together, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we uh, transition, Lord, into this, this time, Lord, uh, as we look into your word, we ask, Lord, that you will bless us, Lord, that you will uh, help us, Lord, to understand the necessity of making the preparation that is needful for us to stand in these last days, Lord. For time is running out. We see the signs all around us. We hear about these signs every week. But Lord, we have to make the preparation. Knowing what's ahead will not prepare us if we don't uh, do our part, Father. So Lord, help us to do our part. And may, as we look in, into your word, may we examine ourselves to see if we're truly of the faith, lest we be reprobate. May your Holy Spirit continue to be with us and bless us now, we pray. Be with the technology and everything uh, connected with it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Just so this can go on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, Who's, who's in the back? Brother Richard, can we uh, change, the, change the screen? We need the screen for the projector, actually. Okay, we see it on the screen uh, here for the online audience, but we need to see it for here. So, Okay, you can put it back, Richard. Thank you. You can, you, okay, thank you. Let me see, hold on. I wonder. Because this is showing a whole other thing right here. It's not even, it's, it's showing another computer. Yeah, so I think it's the input. Yeah, it's a nice bird, isn't it? <laughs> Could get started without it, but I would like you to see the screen. So, uh, just bear with us.
There he is. Thank you. I tell you, what would we do without the tech team? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Yeah, the bird is gone. It was all an illusion, right? <laughs> all right. So we already prayed. And before we get into our study, I just want to show you some things that I did uh, see uh, recently. Uh, so you, do, you, you will get a little update. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, don't want to break the tradition too much. So notice this right here. This is dated April the 8th, 2024. That was this week, right? It says, Germany enforces traditional Sunday rest for automated stores. Look at that. And here's another one. Dated April 4th, 2024. Germany's robotic stores must rest on Sundays too. So robots need rest, apparently, right? When it launched its fully automated stores four years ago, Germany's regional supermarket chain, Tugut, built the experiment as a window into the future shopping. But the folder-based retailer has since been embroiled in a legal fight over a centuries-old principle enshrined in the German constitution Sunday rest. Be they robotic or staffed by humans, most shops in Germany are not allowed to open on the last day of the week. The last day of the week. And courts have upheld that ban. Very interesting. Just kind of scrolling on here. Sunday rest has been enshrined in Germany's constitution since 1919 and was upheld by the Constitutional Court in a 2009 verdict. Then notice this article right here, I'm just showing you. Here's another one. Germany wants its robots to be good Christians. Take Sundays off from work. Wow. You cannot make this stuff up. Um, the robots need to rest on Sundays. Mm. You had a comment, sister? Hold on for me. All right, we can take it off the screen. It's almost like they're trying to condition us to accept the fact that robots are like us, mm -hmm. humans. Right? Right. They need a, they rest off, too? So that something with this robotics movement and, and the fact that they're using these robots, I think is going to play a, a role in the last days. Maybe they'll one day be rounding us up or something. I don't know, but they're walking around just like us, and yeah, that's, that's what I had to say. Hmm. Yes, brother. Yeah, I believe that um, they have this thing that is going on right now with AI, good AI, tremendously good, better than humans. So it's like a child psychological effect that they're using on humans that if you want to be a good human, just like the robot, you will rest on the Sabbath, which is their Sunday. All right. And they already tweaked it to the last day of the week, you know, meaning that it's the seventh day of the week, which is all a false mm -hmm. uh, impression of the reality. So they are trying to tell humans if you want to be as good as AI or the robots, you better allow us to control you so you can re rest and worship on that day. Good boy. Hmm. Not good. See, the thing is, God has created us to be free moral agents, right? We're not, we're not automations. Go ahead, my sister. I was just going to say predictive programming. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just programming us the, the, just like everything they put on the movies they show us what they're doing and we look at it as entertainment but it's actually what they're already planning or what they've already planned so just predictive programming right right yes yeah, umbrella oh the screen praise the lord you may not know how true you are to what you're saying i'm from the tv era 
And so I knew the outer limits and all things of that nature. And just as God said he will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, that means that Satan is bound by the same rules. He must reveal what he's going to do. The James Bond series speaks it all. It really does. It really does tell you what is going on. There was science fiction. Uh, there was a series called The Outer Limits, The Body Snatchers. Everything, everything that was science fiction is actually here. And what that brother said is so on point. What he said is so on point. To be a good human, you have to now act robotic. So as Christ says, I will do nothing unless I reveal it to my servants. That means Satan must be bound by the same principle. Hmm. So he tells us everything that he's not going to do has done. It just hasn't manifested itself yet. Hmm. So brothers and sisters, we can see clearly that uh, the Sunday law is fast approaching. Amen. And we need to make the necessary preparation for what is coming. Um, and there's a whole lot more that we can share. But brothers and sisters, I think more than anything, what we need in these last days is a spiritual update. We need a relationship with Jesus like we never had it before if we're going to be able to meet this crisis. Because we're about to enter a serious time of trouble, uh, such as never was since there was a nation. Uh, we are going to see things we never could imagine. And so we need to make sure that we have a solid footing in Christ. Amen? And as we go to the screen, this is what we're looking at for this evening, this afternoon. The LSD trap. The LSD trap. And you're th probably thinking to yourself, what is this? You're talking about a drug? You'll see it when we get, as we uh, go through this study. Amen? You'll see what we're dealing with. And it's in the Bible. Amen? I'm going to show you. So we need to beware of the LSD trap. Now, what are we called not to yield to, and what does it mean to yield? Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. The Bible speaks about Issachar and tells us that uh, they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So we should know the signs of the times, but these signs of the times are to uh, help us to understand what we need to be doing now. Amen? And so Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 12, the Bible says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. So we're not to yield to sin. We're not to yield to the lust of the flesh, amen, but we're to yield to God as those that are alive from the dead and your instruments as instruments of righteousness unto God. So when you look at that word yield in the Greek, it means, I got it highlighted right here in the yellow, uh, the key definition here. It means to stand beside, to be at hand, to assist, but it also means metaphorically to bring into one's fellowship or intimacy. The question is, who are you in fellowship with? Who are you intimate with? Or what are you intimate with? That's the question. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus or do you have an intimate relationship with sin? That's what it all boils down to, brothers and sisters, because look, we can know all these different things of what's transpiring in our world, but if we don't know Christ, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. Romans 6, verse 16 to 20. What happens when we yield to sin? Are we all there? The Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto what? Righteousness. So if you yield to sin, you are a slave or servant to sin. 
But if you yield to God, you are a servant to God. Amen. Verse uh, 20. It says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So when we yield to sin, we are slaves to sin. We are servants to sin. That's what it says right here. That's what the Bible is telling us, brothers and sisters. So what is sin and how serious is it? We all as Seventh-day Adventists know what sin is, don't we? What is sin? Amen. First John 3, 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression. Another word for that would be violation of the law. And that's talking about God's moral law, his Ten Commandments. And Romans 6, 23 lets us know that this sin, it comes with a cost. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but, thank God for that but. What will we do without that but? Amen. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank God for that but. Amen. Amen. That, that, that there's hope. That Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. That the plan of salvation was already laid. That in case man fell, that the redemption plan would be instituted. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not what? Yeah. Hear. So sin causes us to be separated from God. But thank God in Romans chapter 8, the Bible tells us that nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Y'all quiet up in here. Amen. 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 Maybe it didn't hit register yet. Maybe the, the food is still digesting. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep going. Now, who tips us to sin so that we can be separated from God and be lost? That's right. The Bible tells us in Matthew 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the who? Devil. Devil. Now, that's very interesting. But let me, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5 says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Here's the key point. That Satan tempt you not, for your inconstancy. And so the devil, he has various names, right? He's called Satan. The, words, the name Satan means adversary. You can take it off the screen. That name Satan means adversary. The name devil means slanderer, accuser. When you go to Revelation chapter 12, we'll, we'll look at it in just, just a moment, Dragon, when he's, the Satan is called a dragon, that points to him being a persecuting power. When the Bible calls him a serpent, it points to him being a deceiving power. So those various names in scripture uh, identifies his character, who he is. So when you look at the word tempted in the original Greek, as we go back to the screen, it means to test. It means to scrutinize, to entice to assay or examine. So what Satan does when he tempts us, he examines us to see where our weak points are. And when he sees where our weak points are, he says, okay, I can use that against him. I can use that against her to bring them down. I know how to, to gear my temptations. That's how Satan and his demons work. Scrutinize means to examine or inspect closely and thoroughly. You want to know what this LSD is now? Yes. This is what you've all been waiting for, right? Yes. All right, let's look at it. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. You can take it off the screen now. James 1, verses 13 through 15. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts, y'all. The Bible says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted, notice now, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, this is where you see the LSD. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Lust. Sin, death, LSD. Watch out. 
See, the devil, he, he tempts us. He entices us. He draws us away with our lust. And when we yield to that temptation, we sin. Temptation is not a sin, but when we yield to the temptation, we sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. So we got to watch out, amen? Satan is our real enemy. Nobody in here, we're not enemies, amen? We're all brethren, amen? Our battle is not with flesh and blood. We always got to remember that, brothers and sisters. Satan works hard to try to put us against each other. But we have to always remember, your enemy is not who you see. It's who you don't see. Amen. Amen. Romans 6, verse 12. Let's, as we go back to the screen here. Uh, Ephesians, excuse me. Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Again, the battle is not with who we see, it's who we don't see. It's not with flesh and blood for spiritual wickedness in high places. If we could see how the enemy, how the enemy works hard to try to put brethren against each other, we would, we would, we would fall on our knees and really pray. We would see the devil and his, and his demons laughing. Laughing at us. You had a comment, my sister? Hold on, hold on for a minute. We're going to get you a mic. You can take it off the screen. Thank you. Go ahead, my sister. Yes, praise the Lord. This morning's sermon is proof positive to that text. We war not against flesh and blood because no human created by God can do what was done 40 years ago, 30 right. years ago, during the World War II, the Tuskegee no human could do that to another human. Mm -hmm. So indeed it's true, we are not warring against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness. Only Satan, only demonic spirits can cause a man, a man who claims himself to be a man, mm -hmm. to do what was done to black people. Right. Only demonic spirits can do that. Mm. So we indeed do not war against flesh and blood. Amen. We got a comment right here too. The Bible tells us in John 10:10 10, 10, that the thief, and we know the thief is Satan, he cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The Bible is very clear on that. So we know this, that Satan is behind all this, moving upon the hearts of wicked men to, to do these wicked deeds. Yes. I'm going to go in the same line that my sister was going, but I'm just gonna go a little bit deeper. Uh, God says, do not. Uh, when we look at in our past, what we need to see is how far he has taken us from and where he had brought us now. Mm -hmm. So uh, from my experience in New York with uh, uh, the Black History Month and uh, what a lot of people want to bring up is the fact that uh, as black we have been uh, enslaved, mistreated by the white people. And too often what people think is, let's bring that history back up. Because we were, injustice was done to us. Yes, injustice was done to us. But what we need to understand as Christians is if we, can, if we cannot forget, how do we live, how, how do we move forward? If we keep having that wound, okay, in our heart, how do we get together? When the crisis gets here, will you select who's going to be in uh, uh, the jungle with you? Will you select he must be a black border? Or will he be the person God put next to you? So what I'm saying is we need to go past that because that's the same thing the disciples had, they had among them. They were looking who was supposed to be uh, 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 the greatest. But we can look at the same divide in terms of co color, skin color, and look at, okay, because wrong was done, we have to always bring it up. We have to keep them in check. Hmm. 
God is asking us to keep anybody in check. Right. God is asking us to love. So that's what we need to understand. And when we love, we show, we show Christ's character. He doesn't say love those who love you. He said those love those. Uh, this is a different generation. So we need to go past that in order for us to move forward and work together. Amen. The Bible told us that uh, this will happen. The Bible says that nation would rise against nation, ethnos against ethnos. Uh, that's what it means in the original Greek. That's the Greek word for nations, ethnos, different ethnic groups. And so we're told that this would happen. Um, see, Satan, what he does is he works through various events in, in our lives, um, what I would call, um, what we would call activating events, um, traumatic events that may happen. And through those traumatic events, he works, him and his demons work to instill negative beliefs, uh, false beliefs in our minds. Like, you know, God doesn't really care about you. He doesn't really love you. you you're worthless. Uh, you, you're, no, you're not, you're just a project. You, you, you're nothing, you know, different things of that nature. Um, and as a result of, those, of receiving those negative beliefs, uh, it brings about the consequence, uh, negative fruit, uh, negative character traits. And that's why we see uh, false movements today, like the black, the black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, it's a bitter movement, let's be real. It's very bitter. Um, I'll never forget being in a, a gym, um, and this was when I was staying in Huntsville, and there was a, a black Hebrew Israelite brother. He was running on the, he was walking on the treadmill, and he had scriptures playing. I didn't know he was a Hebrew Israelite at first, but he had the scriptures playing. And then he, he must have dropped something, and then I heard a cuss word come out of his mouth. I said, hmm. Anyway, but I said, you know what? Hey, I, Hey, the, the brother, he, 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 he's trying. He's, he's listening to the scripture. He, he, he's trying to uh, get his life together. Amen. Hey, we all got things we're struggling with, you know. I used to use bad words, you know. So, hey, I'm not here to judge you. And uh, after uh, he got off the treadmill, he came over and talked with me. And we was talking a little bit. And he was uh, saying, man, you need to know what tribe you're from, man. You're a brother. You need to know your tribe and different things of that nature. And he was saying, you know, uh, he, he was a, it was a Caucasian brother, a white brother on the, another treadmill. He was like, this right here, this, this right here, this, 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 this uh, what we have, that ain't for him. That ain't for him. I was like, what? I said, brother, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, it says the everlasting gospel. That's to go to every nation kindred, tongue, and people. And he paused for a little bit. He's like, all right, brother. You, okay, I see where you go. But he couldn't, he couldn't refute that. But I didn't want to get into a debate right, in, you know, right there. I just kind of left it alone. But he gave me some literature, and I, it, he uh, had a picture of their depiction of Jesus. Black brother, white hair, white woolly hair, Bloodshot red eyes, looking mad. I said, that ain't my, I was thinking to myself, that's not my Jesus. And what I read in the spirit of prophecy, you know, his mild countenance and different things of that nature. I said, that don't, no. So well, you, ha you, you have different movements like the black Hebrew Israelites, which is a racist movement, a bitter movement. Um, and it's, it, the, the bottom line is you got a lot of people that they are just embittered about what has happened to them. Um, and that bitterness, if we, if we don't take it to Jesus, will lead us straight into the lake of fire. Um, it, that, that, you know, there's no, um, nothing that can justify uh, individuals treating uh, another person of another race uh, cruelly. You can't blame the, 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 the white brother for something somebody else did hundreds of years ago. Amen? Amen. Or vice versa. And as far as I'm concerned, we all bleed the same blood. We all, we, we all got this, we take peel off our skins. We got the same skeletons, same muscles, heart, all organs, different things. They're a different variety of apples. 
You got red apples, green apples, yellow apples. There are different varieties of tomatoes, different things. God is a God of variety. There are different colors, amen, in the rainbow. God is a God of variety. And I thank God for that, amen? Um, how we get on that subject? <laughs> now, I saw another hand. Yeah, right, right. Uh-huh. Hold on, hold on, we've got to wait for the mic. Hmm? Oh, to, to, to clarify, uh -huh. and I see that it does need clarification. The mere fact that I link those two mm -hmm. does not suggest racism on my part. Right, does right. Not, does not suggest that I'm embittered. It does not suggest that. That's the comments that were made after me suggest that that's what I was suggesting. And that's one of the things we have to be comfortable with, talking about it, but, and knowing that no one is bitter because of it. Simply talking about it does not mean I have hatred and bitterness in my heart. Do you understand? So I need to clarify that because the comments that came after me suggest that I have bitterness in my heart toward white folk. That was not the, if that was the case, Brother Maimon wouldn't have shown that. He was right. just, he was linking that to our health. Right. And so I was linking that no human, no man made after the image of God could do that to another human. Right. Which means that it was a demon that did that. So by God's grace, just please just accept that. Right. For what it is. Right. And yeah, I, 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 I agree with you 100%. I was just picking back off of what he was saying. But I, I agree with you 100% on that. And I, I did by no means thought you was embittered or anything of that nature. But there are people who are. And so based upon his comment, I was just kind of piggyback off of that. But you're, you're right. Amen. And um, one thing that I also see is that this group of people, um, they are feeding hate. And that hate releases dopamine also in the brain. So it gives them a kick, a adrenaline rush. It's like drinking coffee and you get that energy mm -hmm. because of that anger that comes out and they strive for that release of these uh, uh, endorphins. So they feed on each other and anger feeds anger and they believe that that is a spirit. It's almost like a drugs. It's like, almost like going back and back to coffee to get energy. And so they feel like they're, they're spirit filled. They need to get off that drug. It is a psychological hypnotic effect that has been drowning them and they try to share this to other people. While it is, as you said, it is a form of uh, racism against the white. Trying to explain that you are better. You are of a better genealogy branch, if I, if I could say that. Your genealogy line. And God has said clearly in uh, in the Bible that we should not keep ourselves hyped up with genealogies. Mm -hmm. Which line are you from? I am from the Hebrew Israelite way back from Abraham. No, you're a child of God and so is your brother or sister, whatever color they have. Mm -hmm. And Jesus died for them. And he's coming back for them. That's uh, what I just had to fill Amen. in on this. All right, I think we should move on because um, we... We got some more things to cover here. Um, so let's go to the screen. Revelation 12, verse 9. Revelation 12, verse 9. And, that, and just to tie back in what I said earlier, too. Um, again, the enemy is not with who we see, but who we don't see. Amen? And as our sister brought out here, it was the devil that inspired uh, these men to do these evil things that they did with the Tuskegee Project and, and other things. Uh, and even with some of the poor white brethren, how they, uh, with their children, fed those, the feces. I mean, that's, that's wickedness, man. So we know that the enemy is all behind that. Um, Revelation 12, verse 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, 
and his angels were cast out with him. So what state does the enemy want us to be in so that he can cause us to fall? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. When you have it, please say amen. The Bible says, so your page is turned, all right, give you time, amen. amen. The Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Satan wants us to be ignorant of his devices. To be ignorant means to ignore or not understand. That's, that's the state he wants us to be in. So how does Satan come to us with his temptations or deceptions? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, rather. Let me go to 1 Corinthians. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay. Yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. I thought I had the wrong scripture there. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Sorry about that. I, I thought I had the wrong text, but I had the right one. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. The Bible says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Go to verse 13. And we'll read all the, all the way to verse 15. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So Satan is not going to come to, you, to us with a pitchfork and goat's feet and a, a pointed tail. Is that how he came to Jesus? Yeah. No, he came to Jesus as an angel of light. As a matter of fact, the pen of inspiration says that when Satan came to Jesus, he came to him as, he said, basically, I'm the angel that stopped Abraham from slaying his son. That's how he came. And he's like, look, you passed your test. You did good. Now, if you are the son of God, uh, pay attention to that word, if, commanded these stones be made bread. And the reason why Jesus was able to withstand the enemy is because he knew the word of God. He was like, there's no if. Because Jesus, in the previous chapter, in Matthew chapter 3, he was baptized. When he came up out of that water, the spirit of God landed upon him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus was like, no, there's no if. I am the son of God. He knew who he was. And so Satan was also subtly trying to put doubt in his mind as to who he was. But Jesus knew the word of God. And because he knew the word of God, he was able to withstand the enemy. Jesus was not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Hold on just for a moment, sister. I'll come to you. Uh, Great Controversy, page 509, paragraph 2 says, The tempter often works most successfully through those who, who, le who are least suspected of being under his control. Let me read that again. The tempter often works most successfully through those who are least suspected of being under his control. Great Controversy 509, paragraph 2. So just because you're in church, don't think, don't think you, you're safe. Um, the enemy comes to church. Demons come to church. Amen. And they'll work through individuals. And that's why we got to always be on our guard. Amen? Always be prayerful. Yes, my sister, you can go ahead. That was a comment I was going to make. Uh, back home in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, when they put up the tent. You can take it off the screen. We had a, a young guy. He was already on cocaine. And when he heard the preacher preach, he came in and sit. And so they asked him why he joined the church. He said he come in to disrupt 
and change and, you know, disrupt the church and everything. But later on, he got baptized. He joined the church for about like 25 years. So they made him from that till he was an elder. But later on, after 25 years being in the church, you know, it's just like deception. When you follow a man, you're going to go wrong. Well, he ended up killing himself with a gun. So that devastated the whole church. And then his family went out, you know. So that's what you go. If we don't follow Jesus and we're trying to follow the pastors and the this and that, and we don't study the word ourselves, and follow man, we'll be led out. So it just devastated the whole church and its family. Amen. Um, it reminds me with what uh, Elder Abraham uh, talked about in Sabbath school today. Uh, he mentioned about uh, like what Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Um, it's very important for us to keep our eyes on Jesus because men will fail you, but Jesus will never fail. And so we got to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. And so we follow that, that minister as they follow Christ. The moment, the moment they stop following Christ, you keep following Christ. Amen? You keep following Christ. Um, Romans 7, verse 18. Where does the enemy aim his temptations? Romans 7, verse 18. We have it, please say amen. The Bible says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So the enemy aims his temptations, he directs his temptations to the flesh. Romans 8, verses 6 through 8 brings out the same thing here. Um, it says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the flesh, is enmity, hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So because we have inherited this sinful nature, we need a power outside of ourselves to help us to do that which is right. Amen? We need a new heart. We need transformation. Going back to the screen here. What makes the flesh and carnal mind so corrupt? Let's go to... Let's look at Galatians 5 for time's sake. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 19 through 21. When you have it, please say amen. The Bible says here, now the works of the flesh are manifest. The works of the flesh, the works of the carnal mind are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall what? Not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that word witchcraft has a very interesting uh, meaning, a word, a Greek word that's used there. The Greek word for witchcraft is pharmakia. That's the Greek word for witchcraft, pharmakia, where we get the word pharmacy, dealing with drugs and, and medications. And then in Revelation chapter 18, and I say this also in reference to Elder, Elder Maimon Wilson's message this morning um, because he brought out some very uh, serious things there, a lot of information. I know he only scratched the surface. He, he was a whole lot more he could have shared, um, but we got to get him back here. Amen. Um, so I thought about Revelation chapter 18. The Bible says that by her sorceries were all nations deceived, talking about Babylon the Great. By her sorceries were all nations deceived. And I was thinking about the presentation this morning, and I thought to myself, I would not be surprised. I was talking to my wife as well. I said, I would not be surprised if the papacy has a role in a lot of this stuff. The papacy. Huh? Oh, in, in, in the pharmacia. And what uh, Elder Wilson was talking about this, this morning. Uh, about the uh, different inoculations that have been put together and different things of that nature. 
Oh. Uh, right. Right. Mm hmm. Right. And so we know what happened during the COVID crisis. Not going to get into too, too much of that right now. We don't want to get flagged. Um, but that was nothing new. We learned that today. That, that was nothing new. They have been doing this for years. They've been doing this for years. But the enemy is all behind it. And like I said, I wouldn't be surprised that as Revelation 18 talks about Babylon's fall, that by her sorceries, by her former Kia, same Greek word as witchcraft in Galatians chapter 5, were all nations deceived. So when we get to heaven, and during those 1,000 years, we're going to be blown away to see how deep this stuff really is. Because what was shown today really barely scratched the surface. And that's just revealing what's just been leaked. It could be, there's a whole lot more we're going to find out when we get to the kingdom. Uh, men are going to have to answer to what they have done. Um, now I'm seeing some hands. Uh, uh, go ahead, sister. I, I haven't heard from you yet. Go ahead. I, I'll come to you next, brother. I wanted to say my thoughts were, even with the um, country living segment, is that we just have to put our trust in God. Mm -hmm. So even when we talk about the pharmacy and the pharmaceutical and what they do, it's that pill, it's that drugs that we are putting our trust in, thinking that that is going to heal us. But it is God who has all knowledge and has all wisdom. And the same way, it, this, the devil always gives a, um, a counterfeit. God has given us natural remedies, natural things, and, and it's not even in the herbs that heal us. It is God. So we must put our trust in God and believe on him and his principles and his practices. And I think that, to me, that was encouraging for today. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, the, oh, uh, that's the main principle. We have to have our trust in God and trust in his plan, his way of what he uh, has instructed us to do. Go ahead, my brother. Yes, uh, first I'll say sorry to the, my sister if uh, what I said before, she saw it uh, the way she saw it, but that was not my intent. Uh, I will just uh, probably, in line of what you are saying now, say this is the same thing that we can see today. What I'm saying is, now it's on a different scale. Now it's the whole world mm -hmm. being affected now. And we have two class of people, okay? We have those who are suffering from what they try to do, and those who know what they were doing. We can have two group of people again. Mm -hmm. Those who are suffering, and we develop hatred against those who, are, who, do, those who implement the same thing, mm -hmm. okay? So what I'm saying is, if we cultivate that hatred in our heart, we cannot make it to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are going. We just saw something very light, very light with the pandemic. It's going to get worse. But what Christ did when he was going through his trial, he never looked at them. He says, they don't even know what they are doing. Mm. So that's, when we, that's when, when we understand this is the message God wants us to have. Not looking at the world or these people, okay, whoever they are, who are pushing the button here and there. Because we're not fighting against blood and flesh. Mm -hmm. When we, when we see so-and-so, or let's say the guy who was in charge of uh, uh, NIH, we can say, okay, we need to hate him. No, we need to love him. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't know what he's doing. He's mm -hmm. being an agent of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Our eyes is either on Christ, mm -hmm. or we are watching for what the enemy is bringing through our brothers and sisters. Mm. So we don't fight against our brothers and sisters because we can see them. We see in them what the enemy is doing, and we're trying to reach out to our brothers and sisters and plead with them and see if they will accept the message and get home with us. There is nothing else we can do. Amen. Real quickly, brothers, then we're going to move on. And what we'll do is I'll right. get through this presentation, and then I'll open the floor for comments and, and questions. But go ahead. All right. I will make it even shorter than I was going to make it. All right, here in Consuls for the Church, page uh, 105, Ellen G. White says, By the use of poisonous drugs, many bring upon themselves lifelong illness, and many lives are lost that might have been saved 
by the use of natural methods of healing. The poisons contained in many so-called remedies recreates habits and appetites that mean, that mean to ruin both soul and body. And that is something that we saw this morning also as mm -hmm. the brother presented his uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is what I got to say too. I believe that most of the pharmacists, they are not aware of what they are in. Right. They mean good. But we that already know the truth, we should do better and advise better, but still we need to have that loving compassion to bring to them this true message in a loving way that they will also repent. All right, let's go to the screen. I'm gonna read this uh, statement here from Review and Herald, May 19th, 1891, paragraph nine. As we uh, go back to the screen here, I'm gonna read this statement. All right, can we go to the screen? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go ahead, brother. You got a you got an extra a few seconds. Go ahead. And they call it a practice. It's the number three yeah. pillar of patience. Yeah. How dare, kind of, how dare you come in and try to point your finger at natural medicine and say that they can be seriously harmful? And I, then I mentioned to them, I said, have you ever heard of anybody, any patient, overdose on the use of pineapple or sour sap or eating of apple? And he was thinking, and I let him think. I said, you know why, Doc? they came out of God's pharmacy, but just, just the word pharmacy, meaning it in a good way. Hmm. You know what I'm meaning it? As a witchcraft. All right? So it came out of God's remedy house. Mm -hmm. That's why we cannot overdose on these things. Right. And I went on, but I hope that the brother is back. He's, he's going back now. He's going back. All right. All right. So, all right. We can go back to the screen now. And we'll read this statement here. Review and Herald, May 19th, 1891, paragraph 9. It says, Satan cannot read our thoughts, but he can see our actions. That's why we read about uh, him tempting us. The uh, Greek word definition said he scrutinizes, he examines. So he cannot read our thoughts, but he can see our actions. Hear our words, and from his long knowledge of human family, he can shape his temptations to take advantage of our weak points of character, and how often do we let him into the secret of how he may obtain the victory over us? Oh, that we might control our words and actions. We're going to look at just some examples of individuals who were provoked or who were overcome on some of their weak points. We have Saul here. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We won't read all of this, but we'll just kind of go through a sum here. 1 Samuel chapter 18. Because, brothers and sisters, again, we can have all the knowledge about what's coming and all the knowledge of what they're doing to us and different things of that nature, but the bottom line is, do we know Jesus? That's, that's what it all boils down to. Do we have a saving relationship with Christ? So what does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Do I have the, uh, do I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? I'm nothing. Um, do I understand all mysteries and have the gift of prophecy? I'm nothing. So the bottom line is we have to have that connection with Christ 
so that we can reflect his character fully. Amen? Okay, 1 Samuel 18, looking at verse 6, it says, and we can take it off the screen now. It says, and it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and with joy and with the instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. Uh-oh. Now think about this for a moment. Prior to this, now we know that the Spirit of God had already departed from Saul. And an evil spirit was, messing, was tormenting, with, tormenting him. But still, up to this point, until this point, he had no issue with David. David would come in, play the harp for him, and he would be relieved. But his heart was open to this demonic influence of jealousy and envy because of his disobedience. The spirit, the, he had left the, the spirit of God had left him. But the women are chanting, Saul has slain his thousands. David is ten thousands. Verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me, they have ascribed but thousands. What can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. He wasn't eyeing him before. Yeah, so what those women were doing, they was, it's like they were creating competition. Saul is slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. And that put that spirit of rivalry and jealousy in his heart. Um, and so he eyed David from that point forward. Verse 10, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he, and, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when the, Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. David was faithful in his work. But see, Saul, he had a weakness of character. His weakness was love of approbation and being praised by men. Is that your weakness? Do you have a weakness? We all have weaknesses. But that was Saul's weakness. Love of approbation and being praised by men. And Satan worked on that. I, I, go, you have something to say? <laughs> but the lesson we have to learn as a church hmm. is remember it said the women... So we have to be wise in our praise to all of our fellow brethren mm -hmm. because we can help jealousy be raised in that individual. Mm -hmm. That's right. Good point. Let's go to the screen. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 650, paragraph 1. It says, the demon of jealousy entered the heart of the king. He was angry because David was exalted above himself in the song of the women of Israel. In place of subduing these envious feelings, he displayed the, weak, the weakness of his character and exclaimed, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Patriarchs and Prophets 650, paragraph 1, reading paragraph 2. One great defect in the character of Saul was his love of approbation. This trait had had a controlling influence over his actions and thoughts. Everything was marked by his desire for praise and self-exaltation. His character of right and wrong was the low standard of popular applause. No man is safe who lives that he may please men and does not seek first for the approbation of God. It was the ambition of Saul to be first in the estimation of men and when this song of praise was sung, a settled conviction entered the mind of the king that David would obtain the hearts of the people and reign in his stead. So he became jealous. 
But here's another weak trait of character. Now, these things in the Word of God, they're written for our learning, for our admonition. Amen? 1 Samuel chapter 21. And this was when Saul was in hot pursuit of David. And David was, he was basically running from Saul. And David at times displayed his weakness of character while going through this serious trial. The Bible says in verse 1, it says, Then came David to Nob, to Abimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto him, Elect the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, let no, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my service to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. So David is basically lying. He's lying. The reason why, we, we know the circumstances. He was running from Saul, and he, was, he couldn't trust nobody. He was like, man, if I tell him what's going on, he might turn me into Saul. So he, he couldn't trust nobody. So he was afraid, and so he came up with a lie. And the priest, verse 4, and the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hollow bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in a vessel. And the, so the priest, notice this now, so the priest gave him hollow bread, for there was no bread but there, there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Verse 7. Let me skip on down here. Look at verse 8. Here's what I want to get to. And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business requireth haste. No, you weren't under the king's business. You're running from the king. But, you know, he was afraid he couldn't trust nobody. But verse 9 says this, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is none other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. What do you gather from that? Ahimelech giving David the sword that he used to cut off Goliath's head. God was trying to remind David in this moment of trial Look, remember the faith that you had in me when you slew Goliath. You need to have that same faith now as you're running from Saul. If you, if, if you had the faith in me to conquer a giant who was bigger than Saul, you need to have that same faith now. And so God was in his providence because Himelech had that sword. In his providence, even in spite of what David was doing, lying and different things of that nature, he was like, David, just trust me, son. Trust me. Amen? Trust me. That's what we need to do. David's weakness or area of sin was his lack of faith in difficult times. Do we have that? When we go through hard and difficult times, we display a lack of faith. And oftentimes, God, in, in his mercy and love for us, in his compassion for us, he does just like what he did to David. Remember this sword? Remember the sword that you used to slay Goliath? Remember how I delivered you in the past? That's why we need to keep the receipts of how God has delivered us in the past. Amen? We, we need to keep the receipt. A lot of times when we go to the ATM machine, we get the money. Sometimes we may say, I don't want the receipt. But we, when it comes to what God has done for us, we need to keep the receipts. Keep a record of what God has done for us. So when we go through those hard and difficult times, we can say, all right, I got the receipts right here. God did this for me last year. And he did this for me the year before. So this year is not going to be any different. He's going to deliver. Amen? That will help strengthen us. Amen? Going to the screen. 
Patriarchs and Prophets, page 656, paragraph 2. David fled to Achish, the king of Gath, for he felt that there was more safety in the midst of the enemies of his people than in the dominions of Saul. So David had got to a point that where he was so afraid of Saul that he went to Gath, to the king of Gath, went to the Philistines. But it was reported to Achish that David was the man who, was, who had slain the Philistine champion years before. And now he who had sought refuge with the foes of Israel found himself in great peril. But feigning madness, so he made himself like a madman. Feigning madness, he deceived his enemies and thus made his escape. The first arrow of David was his distrust of God at Nob. Here it is, what we just read. And his second mistake was his deception before Achish. David had displayed noble traits of character, and his moral worth had won him favor with the people. But as trial came upon him, his faith was shaken, and human weakness appeared. That's why we need to overcome these small tests now, brothers and sisters, but because we're about to enter a great test. That's the final exam, and we can't fail on that. And when that final exam comes, will we display human weakness? Or will we display the character of Jesus? Reading on. He saw in every man a spy and a betrayer. In the great emergency, David had looked up to God with a steady eye of faith and had vanquished the Philistine giant. He believed in God and he went in his name. But as he had been hunted and persecuted, perplexity and distress had nearly hidden his he heavenly father from his sight. A lot of times, you can take it off the screen. A lot of times, we, you know, we, just like Peter, I think about Peter. He was walking on that water. But then, as the waves and the billows were rolling, and as the, I can imagine the lightning and everything flashing, the, the storm was terrible. He took his eyes off, of, his attention off of Jesus. Because he was looking by faith. Because you can imagine, it was pretty much dark out there. So he was looking by faith walking on that water, but he took his attention off what he should have been focusing on and started looking at the difficulty. And as he started looking at the difficulty, the waves and the, the billows rolling, he began to sink. So when we go through the trials, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? When you're going through the difficulties, when you're going through persecution and tribulation, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because the moment you take your eyes off of Jesus and start focusing on the trial, you're going to find yourself sinking. But if you find yourself sinking, do like Peter did. Lord, save me, and he will save you. Amen? Amen. A lot of times, that's all you can do when you're going through that hard, difficult season. All you can say is, Lord, save me. Help me, Lord. And he hears that sincere cry. Amen? Serve a merciful God. Brother, I know you're itching to make a comment. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is, toward the end of this presentation, I'm going to open the floor. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to move quickly so I can give you that opportunity. All right. Um, move on past this right here. Now, we know Solomon's weakness. Solomon, he loved many women, right? But you know he got that from his father. A bloodline, hereditary. We call that hereditary tendencies, right? He developed those hereditary tendencies from his father. Uh-huh. So he had hereditary and cultivated tendencies in this area. But I want to get to this point right here, Miriam and Aaron. I want to get to this right here. Go to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Amen. And it's a chapter, uh, I think it's in Prophets and Kings. I think it's Prophets and Kings or Patriots and Prophets. Probably Patriots and Prophets. But it talks about, um, it's the chapter dealing with David's fall. And it mentions, you know, um, how often, you know, when we look at uh, great men, we focus on all the good qualities and di different things. But when we look at the Bible, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything. It lays it all out. Shows you how even great men of faith have made mistakes and failed. Amen? And that kind of gives us hope and encouragement to know that, um, you know, if we fall and slip up, 
we have these examples before us, how these men, they fell, they, they slipped up, and how they turned back to God and found help and victory, and gain, obtained the victory, amen? And we can do the same. So praise God for these examples, as a sister said here. Okay, Numbers chapter 12, looking at verse 1. I think this one right here is, is real serious right here we're going to look at now. Numbers 12, looking at verse 1, it says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So you have Miriam and Aaron, they're basically, I can imagine, gossiping about Moses. Speaking against a man of God, right? Verse 2, and they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. See, we need to understand, we, when we begin to down the servants of the Lord and we begin to speak negative and all these different things, God hears it. Amen? It's all recorded. God hears it. He heard what they were saying about his servant Moses. Verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. I can imagine God like a, the father he is. Come out, you three. I'm, I'm tired of this foolish. Just come out right now. And they all coming out. Verse 5. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. You two, come here. Come here. And they both came forward. Verse 6. And he said, he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, mm. causing the, 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 the Lord's presence to be removed from the tabernacle because of that gossiping, backbiting spirit. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous because she was the main instigator behind it. Aaron was the follower, just like he always was, a follower. White as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. And let not let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And notice the spirit of Moses here. Verse 13 says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. That's the right spirit, amen? Praying for those who were speaking evil of him. Mm. He could have been like, That's just the consequences of your actions. And he could have moved on. But he didn't do that. He prayed. But see, this is why, you know, we can love our enemies. We can pray. But we can let God deal with, the, deal with them. Amen? See, when God deals with the situation, he deals with it. Because verse 14 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. He said, no, I'm not going to heal her immediately. She needs to think about what she did. She's going to stay out here seven days. Verse 15. Yeah, time out for seven days. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Notice here now, because of this backbiting gospel spirit that was, that was done by Miriam, and Aaron partook of it as well, it caused the anger of the Lord to be kindled, caused the cloud to remove from the tabernacle. His presence was removed. And also we see right here that they could not continue their journey to, toward Canaan. It couldn't leave. They had to wait. All because of this sin. They could not progress forward. 
These things are written for our learning, brothers and sisters. So when we enter entertain the backbiting, when we entertain the gossiping, when we entertain the murmuring and complaining and all these different things, we're repeating the same history of ancient Israel. And guess what? It will, it will cause us to not move forward, but move backwards. It will cause the presence of the Lord to not be with us. You see how serious this is? So we can talk about Sunday law all day, all we want to. But let me tell you something. If we, may, if we continue on with this spirit, if we have this spirit, not just here, but anywhere. I'm speaking anywhere because we got online viewers. If we have this spirit, we will not be ready for the Sunday law. We will not be ready for the Sunday law. We will keep Sunday. Serious, isn't it? The weakness of a character for uh, Miriam and Aaron, what you see right here, especially Miriam, was ambition, jealousy, and evil surmising. Let's go to the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. 1 Timothy 6. 3 through 5 says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, to supposing that gain is godliness, from with such withdraw thyself. Surmisings. When you look in the original Greek, it means suspicion. To surmise means to infer from incomplete evidence. In other words, you don't got all the, you don't have all the evidence. It's incomplete. You're you're just suspicious. Imagine to be the case are true or probable. Noun and it, it, as a noun, it means a message expressing an opinion based on incomplete evidence. So if you're surmised that something is true, you don't have much evidence or knowledge about it. Near synonyms are, are guess, con conjecture, and suppose. You might say, I can't even surmise what he would do in such a situation. Surmise came to the English from the French surmetry to accuse. To accuse. Mm. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan is the accuser of the brethren. This is coming from Patriots and Prophets 383, paragraph 1. Moses felt the importance of the great work committed to him as no other man had felt it, ever felt it. He realized his own weakness and made God his counselor. Aaron esteemed himself more highly and trusted less in God. He had failed when entrusted with responsibility, given evidence of the weakness of his character by his base compliance in the matter of the idolatrous worship at Sinai. But Miriam and Aaron, blinded by jealousy and ambition, lost sight of this. Aaron had been highly honored by God in the appointment of his family to the sacred office of the priesthood. Yet even this now added to the desire for self-exaltation. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Regarded themselves as equally favored by God, they felt that they were entitled to the same position and authority. Yielding to the spirit. We talked about yielding earlier, right? Yielding to the spirit of disaffection, Miriam found cause of complaint in the events that God had especially overruled. The marriage of Moses had been displeasing to her, that he should choose a woman of another nation instead of taking a wife from among the Hebrews was an offense to her family and national pride. So poor was treated with ill-disguised contempt. Reading uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 385, paragraph 1. This manifestation of the Lord's displeasure was designed to be a warning to all Israel. And it's a warning to us today, amen? To check the growing spirit of discontent and insubordination. If Miriam's envy and dissatisfaction had not been singularly rebuked, it would have resulted in great evil. Envy is one of the most satanic traits that can exist in the human heart, and it is one of the most baleful in its effects. Says the wise men, wrath is, e is cruel, Anger is outrageous, but who was able to stand before envy? Proverbs 27, verse 4. It was envy that first caused discord in heaven, and its indulgence has wrought untold evil among men. Where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. James 3, verse 16. Let me read this here. It should not be regarded as a light thing to speak evil of others or to make ourselves judges of their motives or actions. 
He that speaketh evil of his brother and judge of his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. James 4 verse 11. There is but one judge, who, he who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. And whoever takes it upon himself to judge and condemn his brother is usurping the prerogative of the creator. Murmurers and complainers should remain at home. First temp, this is First Testimonies, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 526, paragraph 2. Murmurs and complainers should remain at home where they will be out of the way of temptation, where they cannot find food for their jealousies, evil surmisings, and fault findings, for the presence of such is only a burden to the meetings. They are clouds without water. So if you are a murmur and complainer, stay at home. Not my words. I'm just reading the counsel. Amen? If you murmur and complain, if you have a habit of evil surmising, stay at home, pray, ask God to cleanse you, and once you're cleansed, come on back. Amen? Amen. You got to be put out the camp for a season like Miriam. Amen. Get put out the camp. Think about what you're doing. Pray, ask God to deliver you, and then come on back. Amen? Because we love you anyway. Moses. Now, the Bible we read in Numbers 12 that he was the meekest man on the earth, right? But Moses had a trying season. Miriam had just died. The people are whining and complaining. Oh, would to God we had died in this wilderness. There is no water. Now, when their fathers went through this situation before, God told Moses, smite the rock. This time, God said, speak to the rock. And Moses, in his anger, because of the people complaining and the different things, he said, look here, you rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? The water came out. Amen? The water came out. But you know what God told Moses? He said, you will not enter the promised land. And Aaron, you're not going either. Because you supported him in this. You're not going in that promised land. Because you failed to glorify me before the people. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Moses got hot. He was upset. The Bible says in Psalm 106 that he sinned with his mouth. Our mouths will get us in trouble. Our mouths, if we don't control it, if we don't control this tongue, this member right here, that can do a lot of damage, this member right here, this tongue that can tell somebody off in a heartbeat, if we don't control it, that tongue and our whole bodies will end up in the lake of fire. This is serious, brothers and sisters. What was the weakness of, of Moses right here? Failure to trust God in difficult times, manifestation of temper, and impatience. I got to read this. Patriots and Prophets, page 417, paragraph 4. Moses' distrust of God. Moses manifested distrust of God. Shall we bring water, he questioned, as if the Lord would not do as he promised. Ye believe me not, the Lord declared to the two brothers, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. At the time when the water failed, their own faith in the fulfillment of God's promise had been shaken by the murmuring and the rebellion of the people. The first generation had been condemned to perish in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Yet the same spirit appeared in their children. Would these also fail of receiving the promise? As a sidebar, as parents, we have to lead by example. If we're murmuring and complaining, we're training our children to do the same. Weary and disheartened, Moses and Aaron made no effort to steam the current of the popular feeling. Had they themselves manifested unwavering faith in God, they might have set the matter before the people in such a light as would have enabled them to bear this test. By prompt, decisive exercise of authority vested in them as magistrates, they might have quilled the murmuring. It was their duty to put forth every effort in their power to bring about a better state of things before asking God to do the work for them. Had the murmuring at Kadesh been promptly checked, what train of evil might have been prevented? As it says, all who profess godliness are under the most sacred obligation to guard the spirit and to exercise what? Self-control under the greatest provocation. The burdens placed upon Moses were very great. Few men would ever be so severely tried as he was. Yet this was not allowed to excuse his sin. 
God has made ample provision for his people, and if they rely upon his strength, they will never become the sport of circumstances. The strongest temptation cannot excuse sin. However great the, ple the, ple the pressure brought to bear upon the soul, transgression is our own act. It is not in the power of earth or hell to compel anyone to do evil. Satan attacks us at our what? Weak points, but we need not be what? Overcome. However severe or unexpected the assault, God has provided help for us, and in his strength we may conquer. Amen? Let's look at one more example. Peter. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Now, God worked to help Peter overcome his natural prejudice, right? Um, he gave him the vision of those, those beasts that were on that sheet, and he led him to go see Cornelius and to preach the gospel unto him and his family, and the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. And Peter recognized what that vision was all about. And Peter was like, look, these folks need to be baptized. The Holy Ghost fell upon them. Who, who am I to, to keep them from being baptized? And so the Lord did a work upon Peter. But there were certain brethren that still held to this prejudice. And so we go to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. It says, but, because Paul had to rebuke Peter. And he had to rebuke him on the spot when this, what we're about to read right here, took place. It says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, those brethren from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles, and they were having a good time talking. But when he saw those certain brethren who were believed in the circumcision, who came from James, he was like, trying to act like he, didn't, he wasn't over there. So I don't want them brethren to see me that I'm sitting over there, sitting over here eating with these Gentiles. And then it says right here, verse 13, and other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Paul had to step in and deal with it. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, public rebuke, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compelest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? What are you doing, man? Right. Peter's weakness right here? Just like he manifested when, uh, during that trial of Christ, Fear of men, that was his weakness. Fear of men and given an appearance of prejudice. He, he, he was fearful of men, that's the main thing. Fearful of what men would think. If we have fear of men, we're not going to make it. I'll tell you that right now. The same Peter who had denied his Lord three times, in this instance right here, he had a weak moment. He got caught off his guard. But he accepted that, but the difference between uh, uh, the Peter of the past and this Peter right here is that he humbly accepted that rebuke. He said, Paul, you're right. I messed up, man. Thank you for that, brother. And he corrected himself. Amen? But that, that's just to show you how we have to always be on our guard. Life sketches of Paul, it says on page 71, it says, I'm reading on the screen. Let's go to the screen. When Peter at a later date visited Antioch, he acted in accordance with the light given him from heaven and the decision of the council. He overcame his natural prejudice so far as to sit at the table with the Gentile converts. When certain Jews who were most zealous for the ceremonial law came from Jerusalem, he changed his deportment toward the converts from paganism and so marked a decree that it left a most painful impression upon their minds. Quite a number followed Peter's example. Even Barnabas was influenced by the in, in judicious, in judicious course of the apostle and a division was threatened in the church but Paul who saw the wrong done the church through the double part acted by Peter openly rebuked him for thus disguising his true sentiments his true sentiments was he, he enjoyed sitting with those Gentiles but when he saw those certain brethren from James he got afraid and moved just it, it reminds you of the Peter that when they ask him you you a follower of Jesus too I don't know the man 
Then time went on. She, I know I saw you with Jesus. I told you I don't know the man. A whole hour went by. He had time to think about what he was doing. Because it's the same Peter that said, Lord, I'll go to prison with you, Lord. I'm going to die with you. I'm going to, I'm going to stand for this message. I'm going to be ready for the Sunday law. That same Peter, when that last person came, I know you were seven day Adventist because your speech gives you away. I saw you over there at state line too. <laughs> Peter said, oh yeah, blank, blankety blank, I told you I don't know the man. Right. He went back to that old talk he used to have. Right. And then that cock crew. And he realized what he did. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, let him that think he be stand, take heed lest he fall. Amen? Is there one who, has, who was not overcome by the enemy? 1 Peter 2, 21 says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye shall follow what? His steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When the Bible, we can take it off the screen. The Bible talks about, in Revelation chapter 14, the 144,000. It says that these are they that follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. And the Bible also says that no guile was found in their mouths. This lets me know that those who will stand during this last crisis will be reflecting the image of Jesus fully. That's the experience that we must have. They're going to overcome all the weak character traits that they have. They're going to have com complete victory over sin. Reflecting Jesus fully. Following the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. That's the experience that we need if we're going to make it, brothers and sisters. Amen? And I praise God for this text right here. Hebrews 4, verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And that's why we could come boldly before the throne of grace. I'm going to read this in Great Controversy 510, paragraph 3. Then I'll open the floor for some comments. Satan assailed Christ with his fiercest and most subtle temptations, but he was repulsed in every conflict. Those battles were fought in our behalf. Those victories make it possible for us to conquer. Christ will give strength to all who seek it. No man without his own consent can be overcome by Satan. The tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He may distress but he cannot contaminate. He can cause agony, but not defilement. The fact that Christ has conquered should inspire his followers with courage to fight manfully the battle against sin and Satan. Here it is, Great Controversy 623, paragraph 1. Now while our high priest, our great high priest, is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ, not even by what? Thought. That's deep. Not even by thought. Could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation? Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. You can't stop certain thoughts from coming into your mind. But you can, you can change the channel. You don't have to dwell on it. Amen? So the enemy, he'll put thoughts in your mind. You'll be like, man, where'd that come from? You ever had that? You could be sitting down reading and all of a sudden you... A thought came to your mind. You're like, where did that come from? Oh, I ain't trying to think about that. Change the channel, amen? amen. It's just like when you have a, you're watching a YouTube video. You're probably watching Fountain View Academy, listening to those beautiful songs. And all of a sudden, an ad pop up. Hit skip. <laughs> amen. amen. Turn it off. So you can't, keep, you, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest. Amen. So I just want to throw that out there. So Jesus, not even by a thought, it says, could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation? Satan finds in human heart some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. John 14, 30. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that will enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those who must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. That's your Sunday law update right there. 
This is the condition that we must have if we're going to stand during the Sunday law. We see the signs. We hear about these signs every week. I now gave you some more signs today. I could have gave you some more. But what I want you to understand is we can know all this information and you can still be lost. That's what I want you to understand. We have to overcome our weak points of character if we're going to stand in these last days. Amen? That's what we need to do. And we can point the finger at this person, that person, but we need to be like, it's me, O oh Lord. It's me. We can take it off the screen. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's what we need to be doing, brothers and sisters. Because all of us individually, our names are going to come up. And how shall we stand in this great day? Shall we be found before him wanting or with our sins washed away? We all have to individually give an account to God. You can't blame your pastor. You can't blame your elders. You can't blame your, your, your church. You can't blame nobody. Because like T. Marshall Kelly said in that one song, if I should die and my soul be lost, it ain't nobody's fault but mine. Because guess what? You and I, we make the decision to yield to sin. Yeah, the people complained and murmured against Moses and all those different things. But it was no excuse because Moses could, made the, he could have made the decision not to smite that rock. But he chose not to control himself and he smote that rock. And he was not able to enter the promised land. So it's a very serious thing. These things are written for us. And we need to take note, amen? Now, I know there were some comments, so we'll take some comments before we close. Our questions. Yes. Go ahead. I just want to thank you. Thank you for this presentation. And what I've learned is that um, God has given us examples so that we can find out, you know, and, and search our hearts and open up to him like, what are our weaknesses so that we can bring that to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. And I'm like this. And I'm so, God, I'm so glad that God revealed not just the men that we always talk about in the Bible, all their goodness, but he revealed everything that we need to know. So I'm so thankful. So praise God for this presentation. Amen. Praise the Lord. I see two hands back here. I see Brother David and her sister right here. Yeah, um, what I wanted to say earlier, uh, thank you very much for the word. That Amen. was really good. Praise, Praise God. Um, there is a correlation, a pattern, if we look into these different accounts as of David, um, as of uh, Elijah, as of uh, Peter, but also um, in the account of Jesus. Um, the pattern that you see in this case here, we have the same thing going on within our own uh, situation as of right now. That's why I believe it's a very good message right now. Um, you would see that David was fortified, hyped up to counteract any attack from outside. Outside, like Goliath was from outside, attacking Israel. He was so confident about God being with him and fighting the battle. However, little did he know, and so unprepared he was for an attack within inside. Mm. Mm. Little did he know that his greatest challenge would come from within. And mm. that brought up a lot of paranoia and insecurity where who are you my brother you know it's like I, I can't trust anybody because I thought you were my brother and I'm going where somewhere with it where you have been mm -hmm. um, and you will see that in the pattern of Elijah Elijah was hyped up and strong against the Philistines and all those that were unbelievers however when it came from within Elijah did run for the woman Hmm. You would see the same case with Peter. Peter was ready, but when he was within the house, right there, 
and people that you normally should be hoping to count on that they will give justice. And you're in the house of justice where Jesus was judged, hmm. like how we are going to be judged. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was wrongly judged. But to Peter, all of this was almost in the same branch like David. Mm -hmm. How dare we call this justice? Hmm. All right, and, and it, it, it didn't stop right there. So Peter panicked, just like how David panicked, and they made the wrong decisions, you see. But as we go to Jesus, can you imagine how painful it has been for Jesus to wash the feet of Judas, hoping, praying for each of the 12 disciples, and you see that Judas still is lingering and not moving. And he knew back then that he ain't going to move. He's going to stay on this path to destruction. It was also from within. And Jesus was crushed even at, in Gethsemane when all of his friends supposed to be there to stand with him and pray because of what was about to happen. And they did not know a clue. Where we are going right now is the same thing. From within, our greatest, our church is so strong against the Sunday law. We are so strong, so ready. We are extra fortified. Mm -hmm. But from within, when you see your brother beside whom you have been sitting all along turn against you. Mm. When you see your sister who has been sitting beside you all along comes against you. Mm. How will we stand mm. in that great day? And that is the message that you have been bringing. This, this doesn't intrude. I want you, if you see anything that I'm doing that is not right, please say it. Don't think I'm going to say, oh, you're judging me. No, please speak up. You know, it's not about speaking up. It is about being annoying. That's what you were saying, actually, just murmuring and annoy, being annoying. Mm -hmm. But not just reprove. We have to reprove prove each other in the Lord. Right. You know, we do have to. Right. So we're not shutting down the fact that don't talk to me. Just be in the word. No. Right. We have to reprove each other. Right. So do reprove me if you see anything that I need to correct. You know, my right. face might not be happy, but you told me. Right. Because I want to make it. Mm -hmm. You know, so in love, let's admonish one another. But the greatest danger is from within the house. We should not attack each other we have one great mission and that is Jesus is coming soon and that is that we have to actually literally encourage one another to cry out for the Holy Spirit and be in one accord mm -hmm. that's it amen it reminds me of a statement where she says we have far more to fear from within than from without we're gonna take my sister right here and then your brother Richard Praise the Lord. There were uh, two points that I wanted to make. Uh, the one about Miriam, uh, how sweet that is. God is just showing us who we are. Remember now, she was the one that watched Moses go down that Nile River. That's right. She was the one that told Pharaoh's daughter, I know someone. This is the same Miriam. And so what happened? God is showing us our character, our personality. We can push someone forward because we see that God is in them. God is moving, doing something, positioning them. But then jealousy takes over. Mm -hmm. And we see that that person is exceeding what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And we've been in the church longer than they have. Mm. God is showing us who we are mm. through that experience. Mm -hmm. The same thing he did with Achan, the, uh, what Miriam and uh, Aaron said, is he only speaking through them? Isn't that what, uh, not Achan, uh, Korah, that's Korah. what Korah said. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Korah, does God only speak through you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's showing us us. The other thing with Peter, Peter, oh my goodness, Peter, 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 Peter. <laughs> People talk about Peter. Yes, he took his eyes off of Christ for a moment, just for a moment. But has anyone ever considered how did he get back to the ship? Mm. God didn't carry him. Jesus didn't carry him. That means that he walked on water again mm -hmm. back to the boat. Mm -hmm. That's the Peter that I 
admire. Mm -hmm. Yes, he took his eyes off for a second, but then when he said, Jesus saved me, he knew that he was saved and that he could walk back with Jesus mm -hmm. to that ship. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Excellent point, especially about uh, Miriam and those good qualities that she did have, especially as a as a young girl, how she helped uh, her baby brother get in, into the right hands, uh, made sure that uh, that that basket sailed safely, and also told the uh, king's daughter, "I know someone who could take care of him." And the Bible also says that Miriam was a prophetess. So even these mighty men and women of God have had weakness of character that they needed to overcome. So praise God for these examples, brothers and sisters, because they encourage us to let us know, like, look, if we fall and slip up, we can repent and God can help us. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, my brother. Uh, two points. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I, I have been studying on and off the character of Christ. Because that is the only thing that we're going to be taking from here to glory. And one thing about it is when you study the character of Christ, you get to see yourself in Christ, if you understand what I'm saying. Hmm. If you're not where he, he was when he was here on earth, then that lets you know that you got to work on yourself and ask God to take whatever is in you out so you can be ready to go to heaven with him when he comes. Uh, secondly, I was talking to a brother last night. I'm not going to mention the name. Uh, and I was you know, just sharing with him about, you know, as some of us have gone to the hospital to see, our, our assistant pastor. The thing about it is this. Why is it that we have to wait until something drastically happens mm. in order for us to come together as a family? Um, one thing about it is this. When I was younger, at my old church, I would always call and see how people are doing because you never know what people are going through during the week. We only see each other once or maybe twice a week if we come to a prayer meeting or we may see each other in the city somewhere. But I, was, I had made mention to him that we need to call each other during the week, single, married, don't matter, because we all are going through things during the week. And I mean, I use myself as, as an example. I do call others, but there are just certain individuals I cannot call because I know how they are, if you understand what I'm saying. Hmm. And they may snap at you and bite your head off and things of that nature. But the thing about it is, and Sister Tucker uh, sort of brought it out this morning, we need to, you know, be more loving with each other because we don't show that love. We talk about it, but we don't exemplify it in our actions. And that's going to be a big problem when the the Sunday the the national the, the Sunday law comes about the universal Sunday law. Mm -hmm. If we don't have love for one another now, what are we gonna do then? We'll make it. So I mean, mm -hmm. we have to ask God to you know. I know people. Some people are private. You got. Uh, let me just let me just kill this right now. There's nothing private with God because, because God sees everything. Angels are writing every day. He reads your thoughts. He knows your actions. He knows the words you're going to say even before you say them. Mm -hmm. So how in the world are you going to say, I'm a private person? Excuse me, nobody's private, not in the eyes of God. So therefore, we need to 
get out of the mindset that uh, I don't want nobody in my business. We ought to be uh, brothers and sisters keepers. Not saying that we're going to spread their, their business all over the place, but we should be concerned about them. Amen. And that we are not at that point now, when are we going to get there? Amen. Amen. Brother Kalange, and then, uh, and we'll, I'll see if there's anybody who has not made a comment yet. We'd like to make a comment, and then, if I, can, we'll if I can add to what Richard uh, comment is, if, if my business is my business, when do your business become my business? That's what God is telling us to do. How can I be my brother's keepers when, when it's my business, it's my business? When it's your business, it should be your business. But if we fail to understand your business is my business, my business is your business because you are my brother's keepers, we cannot make it to heaven. That's, that's as simple as it is. So uh, I was going to David when he says, when David uh, take his eyes off God, what he saw around him, he didn't see any border. All he saw is spy and enemies. Mm -hmm. Even the men who used to protect him, mm -hmm. he couldn't trust them. So he preferred to run away back to the Philistine instead of staying in the encampment of his brothers. Do we understand what does that mean to us? Mm. Is we prefer to go back to Babylon we prefer to go back to Egypt instead of continue the journey with our brothers and sisters because we are afraid of them. Mm. We're moving to the country, and then what we see, because we don't have our eyes on Christ, in every brothers and sisters around us, we see an enemy. We see somebody who's spying on us, but we don't realize the, the captain, the one who is leading us, he doesn't care about what you look at Christ. He didn't know Judah was going to betray him, but he was confident. He didn't worry about Judah being around him. He warned him. He tried to save him. Mm. But this is the same experience that we need to have. As long as we are looking at uh, our brothers and sisters, we're going to see their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. We're going to see fault in them. But that's not where guys want our eyes to be. We want our eyes to be on him. And uh, I, I think I will let you answer that question is, why is God... Uh, uh, punishing Aaron while David is the one who makes the decision because David is the one in charge. Aaron is uh, the helper. Moses, you may hear Moses. Moses, yes. Why is God also taxing Aaron for David's decision to strike the wall? So when we look, when we, uh, when David, we look at Moses, the, yes. When we look at the character of, of Aaron throughout, especially during the time of the golden calf, Aaron <laughs> was like a people pleaser. Yeah. Uh, wherever the wind blew, it carried him. Yeah. Uh, wherever the tide went, he went. Yeah. And so he, he went with the popular fa favor or whatever. Yeah. But even when we look at the issue with Miriam uh, and her jealousy that she had against uh, Moses and uh, her uh, envy that he had towards Moses' wife, um, she confided into Aaron, and Aaron partook of that same spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> when Moses smote that rock, um, when Moses said, look here, you rebels, Aaron was right there with him, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why God had to punish him along with Moses. Because he partook of that same spirit. He could have checked Moses and be like, no, Moses, that's wrong. We need to pray. We shouldn't do this. Yeah. And that could have changed the whole tide of things, but he failed to do that. And so that's why God had to deal with Aaron and punish him as well. Yeah, we would call Aaron nowadays uh, flip-flap. He would be on one side and then the other side. Um, the, the account of... Uh, I spoke about this, uh, and I like what uh, my sister pulled out. We, we were talking about Peter it, uh, for one second. Um, as I read the account of Peter, Peter did not walk on water. Peter walked on faith. When he took his eyes off faith in Jesus, 
he saw water, and that's exactly where he went into. He sank. So science has proven you cannot walk on water, but we can by faith, by faith, we can walk through fire and everything. You see what I'm saying? Because faith divides science. You see? So the, the, the other thing, um, you had um, Miriam. Miriam was also a source within, so close to Moses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how, how, how could you? Mm -hmm. You know, and that hit Moses. And because it hit Moses, it hit God also. Mm -hmm. Because God and Moses were so befriended that as he said it in the verse that you read, mm -hmm. he didn't need to go and come through visions or do, he would just talk to Moses. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that Moses hit the rock and the rock represented Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Right. So God was disappointed. When reading that account, man, I'm telling you, it, it might look soft, but I cried. Mm. Because I could feel Moses saying, I've been there for you. You know, we went through all of this, God. These people, you know, you wanted to kill them. And I said, kill me instead of them. I have been looking forward to Canaan. Mm. Give me a chance, man. This is the first time. You know, and I was feeling the desire of Moses just to hit that final mark. We've been marching for over 40 years in the desert. Please allow me. Come on. And, and, and I, I cried when I read that account because I felt Moses. And God said, don't ask me again. Don't you ask don't stop me. At that mountain, that you was can hard. See it. That was hard, right? Don't mm. ask me again. Mm. But guess what? We all know the truth. He in a real Canaan. You know, he, he got Heaven better than that. Amen. Amen. You know, it gives me goosebumps even right now. He, he got the best what we are looking for right now. Mm -hmm. That Canaan, that Abraham and all others that are asleep right now, David including, we're looking forward to that Canaan. Moses has that. Amen. I, I would take that upgrade, but back then Moses did not know that, you know, he was going to get the, the real thing, you know, so. Amen. That was real good. And God had to really deal with Moses uh, and Aaron because they, they were leaders as well of the people. Um, and, you know, sometimes you might look at it like, man, why God deal so strong with the brothers like that? Yeah. These people, they murmuring, they complaining, they don't want to cause all this mess. Yeah, the people were complaining and different things of that nature, but they were leaders. And to whom much is given, much is required. And that account teaches us also that leaders have to be held accountable for wrong that they do. Because by doing that wrong, they put a bad example before the people. And so that's why God had to really deal with them the way they did. Now, we can really delve into that, but we'll, we'll leave that alone for right now. All right, so it's going to be a last comment, and then we'll close. I just want to go back to um, the lesson of Aaron, because I think that that. God in his mercy showed us that just like in this day and age that we have a lot of compromisers mm -hmm. and we have a lot of people just going along and they are considered, you know, they want to be in good with any, everybody. They stand in the back. They know things are wrong. They know they should speak up, but they don't. They just mm -hmm. keep quiet. And some of us, we feel that, well, God is not going to judge us because that's not really me. That's not my job. That's his job. I'm just number two. He could speak up. But God shows us that with that example, that we are going to be held accountable. And we are to speak up when we know that something is wrong in a godly way, mm -hmm. not in a gossiping way. He showed us other examples of how to do it, but to trust in him. But he's going to get those that are just standing by. And you can see that the push in the world today is don't make any waves. Don't, don't make a fuss us or you're going to be the bad guy but God shows us that you cannot be indifferent you cannot right. just stand behind somebody or an organization or when you know something is being done wrong you have to speak up in a godly way led by God I just want to put that you can't just speak up in your way and your spirit it has right. to be in God's spirit but God will call us and show us how to do it amen and we see in the Bible how uh, David he did his sin as another leader he did his sin and how 
God, he didn't, he didn't let that slide. He moved upon the heart of Nathan the prophet to go in before David, and he met him where he was. He gave a parable of a lamb because he knew David used to be a shepherd before he was a king. And David was all into that parable. And, he, and at the end of that parable, he was like, that man should die for what he did. How dare he do that to that, take that little man's ewe lamb? How could he do that? He should die for what he did. And then Nathan said, David, you are that man. And it, it was like David was just piercing a heart. He was like, man, what have I done? I've sinned. I'm dead. Nathan said, you're not going to die. But you need to understand there are consequences for your actions. The sword will not depart out of your house. And he gave a whole, some, some more things about you know, things that would happen to him because of his sin. Um, so we have to be bold and we have to call sin by his right name. But let's, like the sister said, we have to do it in the right spirit, of course. Um, brothers and sisters, we got to close. Amen. You can tell Dr. O when, when he comes back that you got a straight testimony. Amen. Amen. So he can let me come back. Amen. <laughs> Do I get an A? Amen. All in favor say aye. aye. All right. All right. Dr. O, you see it. Amen. All right. So uh, let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for these examples in your word, Lord. And we can take comfort to know that uh, you can help us overcome these character flaws and weaknesses, Lord. And in mercy, Lord, you remind us, like you did David, of past experiences that we had and how you delivered us. Lord, help us, Lord, to keep the receipts and, and keep in remembrance those experiences that we had, Lord. We pray a special prayer, Lord. Uh, we cannot fail to mention uh, Pastor Baylock, Lord, is in the hospital, Lord. We pray that you will touch his body. We pray that you will uh, revive his whole body system, Lord. Strengthen him, Lord. And, Lord, we pray that you will get him up out of that hospital, Father. We thank you that uh, you have kept him thus far, Lord, because he, he should have been gone, but you kept him, Father. So we thank you for that. We pray that you will uh, continue to bring about a deliverance. And, Lord, we pray for all... All of us who are here, Lord, you know what we all go through and what we all face. Help us, Lord, in our day-to-day -day battles, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would help us all to be of one accord, to present before the enemy a united front. Lord, help us, Lord, to uh, be prepared and ready, Lord, for what is about to transpire upon this earth that's going to take many by overwhelming surprise. Give us more of your spirit and power, Lord so that we can carry this gospel to a lost and dying world. So many people are dying. So many people are, are hurting, who are sick, and who are just in a lost state. And you have given us a message whereby we are to share with them, Lord, and reach them and win their hearts to you. So, Lord, help us to be about your business like never before. And continue to bless us throughout this week. Bless us, Lord, as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless every single one of you. I hope I see you on Wednesday night. Amen. Thought I'd throw that in there. Have a good night.